and the highlight. The speaker this evening is Dr. Hilary Doda, and the subject is Nostalgia, Longing, and the Embedded Self, Overshot Weaving and Stories of Place in Cape Breton. Hilary Doda is an assistant professor at Dalhousie University, where she lectures in costume studies at the Fountain School of Performing Arts. She holds an interdisciplinary PhD from Dalhousie for research exploring the material culture of dress and textiles in the early modern Atlantic world. Her recent publications include an article in Acadiensis on Acadian needlework tools. Hillary's current research on traditional weaving in Cape Breton has been supported by a postdoctoral fellowship at St. Mary's University. For those of you intrigued, as I am, with the evocative title of Hillary's presentation this evening, Overshot is a textile form that has been produced in Cape Breton from the earliest days of Scottish migration. Despite loss of the skill elsewhere, Overshot's popularity persisted in Cape Breton through the mid 20th century as part of a larger theme of nostalgic identity formation. The patterns carry narratives of longing that developed new importance in a time already fraught with anti-modernist sentiment as signifiers in turn of respectability, hospitality, and lineage. Please welcome Hilary Doda. The floor is yours. Assuming I can find the unmute button, of course. Thank you so much, Lois, for that lovely introduction. I appreciate it. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. And the treaties didn't deal with surrender of land and resources, but recognized the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So in that sense, we are all treaty people. So as Lois um, mentioned, my work is on material artifacts. I look at the evidence of weaving, of dressing, of textile use to try and understand more about the priorities and social interactions of right now Nova Scotian cultures in the early modern and colonial periods. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is a research project I've been conducting slowly during the pandemic on Cape Breton weavers in the 18th through 20th centuries. As Lois mentioned, this is part of a project I've been <coughs> under Dr. Carly Kehoe at SMU through the Atlantic Canada Studies Department. And I was reading about Cape Breton when I started this project, and I got curious about a particular kind of weaving that showed up more here than I'd seen anywhere before. And that's something called overshot. And I'm curious about its persistence in Cape Breton homes and what that can teach us about how those households and families saw themselves and each other. But to start the story, I'm going to begin in the middle. In 1953, at the invitation of the Nova Scotia Sheep Breeders Association, Mary Black, then chair of the Handcrafts Division of the Department of Trade and Industry of Nova Scotia, organized a display of articles made of homespun wool. She was also asked to arrange for a mural to be made as the backdrop for a display, one that would showcase homespun work to the best advantage. Black and her neighbor, Bessie Murray, arranged for the weaving of a mural made from Nova Scotian wool by Nova Scotian weavers that was to represent the history and character of Nova Scotia. And this mural that you see on the screen currently held by the Cape Sable Historical Society was the result. And it shows in seasonal order from left to right, the Acadians in springtime, an Acadian girl under an apple tree there, I'm not sure how well you can see it there, the United Empire Loyalists in summer, represented by the family in the middle, and the lone Scotsman in Cape Breton in autumn. 
And the Scotsman is what made this mural famous. And this is the artwork for which Bessie Murray originally designed the Nova Scotia Tartan. Our wee Scotsman up there in his corner was intended to represent the Scottish settlers in the province. And so was dressed in an original design rather than pick one associated with a particular clan. Now, following this exhibition, the tartan's popularity exploded. Thousands of yards of it were ordered and the mural itself was mostly forgotten. But the trajectory of these textile projects tells us something important about symbolism and visual material culture and how this comes together in our understanding of place and how we demonstrate community. That is, the image of Nova Scotia generated by the mural and the tartan fit this particular mid-century narrative in the wake of what historian Ian McKay has termed the tartanizing of the province, a commercialized obsession with the Scottish folk piece of Nova Scotia's settler heritage. The mural designers constructed a fictionalized image of Nova Scotia as an Acadian English loyalist Scottish province. The Mi'kmaq are entirely absent, as is any one of color. It's a fictional fantasy image of the idea of Nova Scotia, one which omits the original inhabitants while making use of imported materials codified as traditional, defined by a different cultural space and time. In similar ways, tartan weaving has become known as the traditional weaving style of Nova Scotia in general, and of Cape Breton in particular, supplanting in the public eye other techniques which have a, a deeper and older connection to the region. Walter Scott's 19th century romances played a major role in the codification of tartan as the quintessentially Scottish textile with all its neo-Victorian associations with the Highland clans. And Bessie Murray's Wee Scotsman exists in the mural as a mascot for an imagined New Scotland, a declaration of Nova Scotian identity based on a constructed concept of a communal home. This imagined identity and the way it's built into the physical reality of the mural is the same phenomenon we can see when we examine the ways in which overshot weaving became and stayed important within rural Cape Breton communities. So what is Overshot? What am I talking about here? And why is it interesting? Well, Overshot is the name given to an old style of weaving with murky origins. This is a textile form that has been produced in Cape Breton since the early days of Scottish migration. And despite the loss of the skill elsewhere, Overshot's popularity persisted in Cape Breton, more accurately to the early 20th century, and it's then revived in the mid 20th century. And it's not one that popular culture would immediately associate with the Scottish communities of Cape Breton, but nostalgic attachment to it exists. The textile is deceptively simple to look at, but complex both in design and in manufacture. So a tabby weave, a straightforward plain weave, often in cotton, is established as a ground fabric and long shots of thicker fiber, usually wool, usually double the size of the cotton, are added simultaneously as a secondary layer through the same warp. So the same space is woven twice, creating a solid plain textile with floating designs of contrast color. The form was woven on four harness looms in Scottish communities in Cape Breton. And this is in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. And has also become synonymous with colonial craft in the Eastern United States. We do have some drafts collected from Acadian communities, which is wonderful. Uh, they tended to use two harness looms and the overshot form was not as popular there as a result. Now, much of the fabric handwoven in Canadian homes in the later 19th century was done with a blend like this of wool and cotton together. And there was high demand for a rough wool blend, as a quote, for clothing, especially for Canadian winters. In 1870, uh, statistics from the Canadian Industrial Database 
record that 71% of all wool fabric handwoven in Canada was a wool cotton combination, often a local wool weft woven on imported cotton warps. And overshot fits into this tradition, a method that would create a warm double layered coverlet, as well as a colorful and vibrant decorative addition to the home. And it proved far more popular among weavers in Cape Breton than an all wool tartan. In fact, researcher Florence Mackley found when she performed her survey of Cape Breton weaving in the 1960s, that local weavers were unaccustomed to weaving tartan sets at all. A set is the series of threads put together to create that very distinctive repeating tartan pattern. Now there had been a tartan ban in Scotland following Culloden, which undoubtedly put a damper on any widespread ability to design a weave that form during the later 18th century. But methods of weaving overshot textiles certainly arrived in the colonies with European migrants, and these became grounded in the folk traditions of the Appalachians and the Carolinas, as well as in Cape Breton. Now, oral tradition describes migrants bringing both finished coverlets and the manufacturing instructions with them. On small slips of paper, you can see a couple here on your screen now, and these are called weaving drafts. And these encoded instructions were wrapped around small woolen, wooden sticks rather and were tucked into the luggage. And these would then be decoded by the weaver as instructions on how to warp her loom. Many families across Cape Breton Island have saved pattern drafts like these seen here, complete with stories about the direct transmission of those patterns from Scottish ancestors. In Cape Breton folklore, the draft coverlets made in overshot patterns are tied to stories of immigration and resettlement and oral histories of the Hebrides and the Highlands. Unlike tartan, which wasn't woven with any frequency in Cape Breton until at least the 1940s, overshot was deeply tied into the Scottish community's understanding of itself. Now, much of the cultural importance of overshot has been tied to its origins and the question of the historicity of the drafts used to plan and weave it. And a number of different theories have been suggested as to the origin of the style, none of which has gained significant traction. Cape Breton textile historian Florence Mackley suggested that the style originated in Egypt and Persia. Weaver and weaving teacher Mary Black believed it to have come to the United Kingdom with the Huguenot in the 16th century, while modern researcher Evelyn McLeod suggests the overshot patterns came from the east, moving westward with successive migrations of Celtic peoples. Similarities between colonial overshot designs and the raised figures in Scandinavian figure linen weaves may suggest the style originated there. These fabrics include similar techniques for floating the weft and have a similar strong tradition of repeating geometric figures. Norse settlers in the 12th century may have brought that skill set to Ireland, the Hebrides and Scottish Highlands and adapted to local materials from there. And the adaptation is not confined to the materials. And this is where I wish we'd been able to be present at the archives tonight because the Mary Black Flons collection there has a number of these drafts which she and Florence Mackley collected over the years. And those do tend to be undated or recopies of older patterns. What we know is that many surviving drafts are now named for the local women who wove them or who modified an older pattern to better suit their own tastes. Anecdotes from the 19th century suggest that the weaving style was once practiced in the Isle of Skye and the Outer Hebrides, which is the point of origin of many of the families of Scottish weavers in Cape Breton. Now, most of these anecdotes are third-hand reports describing something a grandmother once may have woven or owned in Harris or Lewis in the eight, late 18th and early 19th centuries. We've got this one description here of raised and lowered figures, which describes overshot wool weaving as the same as the damasked forms popular in Irish linens of the time. This is um, from an interview with a woman named Marion. The interview itself was done in 1850. She was born in 1765, and in this quote is describing the weaving she remembers from her childhood. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Gaelic. I'd only mangle it. 
But as she says, they used to raise and depress the weave for figures, shamrocks, flowers, and the like, uh, diamonds, circles of varying diameters, squares, and rectangles. Also, they used to make tassels around the edge, and more used to say a project of that nature in a loom was very intricate. That is, the whole setup had to be done intelligently. And these designs and figures, which were put in linen, were they put in woolen weaving, I inquired. Said she, designs were not put in woolen weaving, except in the woolen bedspread. I myself used to put Steelbeg and Koenig in woolen bedspreads, but not every weaver could do that. So according to this witness, the patterns woven in the Hebrides were primarily made in linen until the late 18th century, and they continue sporadically and infrequently in the woolen bed covers thereafter. Interestingly, versions of some of these same patterns appear in every region where overshot weaving was performed, particularly in those regions colonized by Scottish settlers. So the narrative evidence suggests that motifs similar in style to those found in the overshot coverlets were once woven in the Outer Hebrides, but fell out of favor in the late 18th century. Interest from English aristocrats in the Tweeds in the 1840s, along with the cultural fascination with anything Scottish, elevated the popularity of the hand-woven Tweeds from the Hebrides instead. And this is when Harris Tweed became the predominant textile industry in the islands. By the end of the 19th century, overshot weaving has vanished. Meanwhile, in Cape Breton, in the early 20th century, overshot is still very much in play for blanket making and curtains, as well as for articles of clothing like petticoats. Now, the patterns known today are not all the same as those originally woven in the Hebrides. Some may have been brought north from the Appalachians with returning travelers, while others were modified by individual weavers as they passed the drafts down through the generations. There are multiple different notation forms on the drafts that we have, which indicate different evolutions of the patterns as they were passed from mother to daughter, from friend to neighbor. We see at least three different forms of notations on the drafts collected at the archives. And as they copied and recopied them, weavers adjusted the patterns to suit their own tastes, to suit the available materials, influenced by changing fashions for fabrics in general. And then these patterns were given new names relevant to local history. I love this one. A popular geometric style known in some places as governor's garden is St. Anne's robe in others and Rocky Mountain cucumber in others again. We've got Lee's surrender in the Appalachians which is a variation of a pattern called Braddock's defeat in New York and New Jersey. Now, the Cape Breton drafts are wonderful. They tend to have individuals' names associated with them. The Ainsley spinners and hand weavers have samples of a Mrs. Cody's patterns, one through three, while one Mrs. Gillis's repertoire goes all the way up to 14. Alongside True Love's Vine, Rosebush, and Snowdrop, as well as the very evocative local favorite, Keep Me Warm One Night, the individual modifications and the new extended versions of the original drafts become part of local folklore and repositories of local memory. If we trace the names of the weavers mentioned on the drafts in various archives and censuses and in local histories, we find weavers throughout Cape Breton in the 19th and 20th centuries with a stronger concentration around the Brador and on the West Coast through places like Marguerite, Mabu, and like Gainsley. We see more weavers in places where there happens to be more Gaelic spoken, as well as regions with higher populations of sheep, which seems to be something of a logical extension. Sydney saw less home weaving in general, as store-bought cloth was both less expensive and more readily available. Rural communities had their own sensibilities, separate from the more cosmopolitan and changing world of the ports, where folk tradition and identity could be more entrenched. Now, weaving began to fade as a skill as the younger generations began to move away for work in larger numbers in the early 20th century. Mills like Glendyer and Inverness began production weaving of yardage around 1870, and the population of professional weavers in the region increased from seven on the census in 1851 
to 413 in 1891. But when profits proved difficult to impossible to maintain, the mill ceased production weaving, that'd be in 1913, and the jobs went with it. Weaving was already being considered a craft from bygone days in Sydney in the 1930s, though productive milling frolics were still taking place on the North Shore through the previous decade. The sense of prestige surrounding skillful handwoven fabric dissipated with the rise in availability of store-bought fabrics. First with the use of store-bought garments and cotton textiles for Sunday best, then by supplanting homemade clothing altogether as a marker of dignity. As Dunn described of Cape Breton life in this period of transition, and I quote, the sturdy homespun was no longer the respected symbol of virtuous woman's industry. Now it was scorned by the rising generation as a symbol of outmoded poverty. It's the Craftworks revival of the mid 20th century that's responsible for resurrecting interest in weaving in general and overshot in particular. We get a rise in anti-modernist sentiment in the mid century and this encourages the relearning of older crafts like weaving and woodworking. Initiatives of the provincial and federal governments through programs like the Handcrafts Division of the Department of Trade and Industry supported classes for women to learn commercially viable weaving skills as alternative income streams. Now, these classes originally focused on saleable materials like tartan. Organizer Mary Black was notably disdainful of the, quote, blankets on cotton warps that women in Cape Breton were weaving for practical use. But the access to tools and classes in general increased interest in weaving in all forms of textiles. Florence Mackley's efforts to document overshot weaving drafts in the 1950s led directly to Evelyn McLeod's work in the 1970s to begin teaching the style in earnest, reviving it for new generations of weavers. So what this all means is that there has not been an unbroken popular tradition of overshot weaving. It may have continued through a few people, but generally speaking, we have this gap of about a generation and a half in the early 20th century before it becomes popular again. And that the patterns originally brought from the Hebrides have undergone alterations, either due to errors in copying or due to deliberate changes from individual preferences, uh, style changes, fashionable color changes. And many of the patterns taught in the weaving schools in the later 20th century are not those original to the 18th century Highlands and Islands designs. But when compared to the encouragement of tartan, Overshot's pedigree in the region still has deeper roots. And its hold on the imagination is apparent in the ways in which Overshot shows up in households in Cape Breton. There we go. Studying the material culture of a place, the physical things which matter to people, gives us a different lens through which to understand a society or an affinity group. Objects have social lives of their own. They act as focal points for memory and for ritual. We embed our memories into the objects of our lives, uh, relating this tablecloth to the grandmother who embroidered it, or that pressed flower to the dinner date it was saved from, the t-shirt picked up on our trip to Paris. On their own, objects will collect wear markings and scuffs, uh, pulled threads and repairs that can tell an observer some of their story. But when used as part of daily life, they become links to personal and community histories. And the stories woven around objects turn them into meaning bearing icons, transmitting community values from one generation to the next. Using an object is a vital part of the process of creating meaning. Objects in trunks in attics, objects left in storage or on display in museums don't invoke the same things, or they lose their symbolic meaning altogether when divorced from the context which originally gave them life. Putting an object into use gives it a, a subjectivity, a way for it to continue to generate meaning and responses in the people around it. And objects with stories attached to them become semantically dense filled with both spoken and unconscious cultural meaning, and they serve as repositories for memory. 
in the case of overshot weaving, these iconic geometric draft coverlets become a source of information about Cape Breton connection to Scottish heritage. Overshot designs appear in Cape Breton homes in coverlets meant for beds, that's the most common use. But we also see them in other household furnishings like curtains. And these on your screen here, these curtains from the Lake Ainsley archives were made by Annie McLean. And these are interesting. For as textile historian Dorothy K. Burnham described, curtains were not a necessity in country life in the 19th and 20th centuries. And that's when this example was made, was the early 20th century. Burnham found the interior woodwork of the window frames of these houses suggested they weren't originally intended to be covered. So the choice to hang curtains was uh, either an aesthetic decision or one meant to improve warmth in the house by blocking drafts or both a sign of good domestic management and thrifty respectability. Traditionally, these would have been woven with red or blue floats. And we see quite a few of the coverlets still with those reds or blues. And these were originally favorite colors in Irish weaving. But the coverlets in the area around Glendire Mills in Southwest Cape Breton are fun. These are known for particularly vibrant colors coming from the mill there, the Dyer Mill. And that's just taking advantage of access to that local resource to brighten up the public areas of the home. Because these are meant to be seen. The coverlets and the pillows made in overshot took pride of place in public areas of the homes, as well as in some private bedrooms, but more often the guest bedroom. The guest bedrooms and the parlors were important places of display for these pieces. Interior photographs of Cape Breton homes from the mid 20th century show overshot textiles in the backgrounds of public spaces. You see a lot of them in sitting rooms where the designs and colors would have been at the forefront. They become focal points of that space where the public self is constructed for community viewing. Evelyn McLeod collected a lot of anecdotes from the same time period describing coverlets draped over kitchen couches as well as guest beds. And these are spaces of the home that straddle that line between private and public. This use pattern, along with the overshot made for things like curtains and carriage blankets, carriage blankets pop up in some of these anecdotes as well, strongly indicates these pieces were meant for public view. So they're not private. The public private spaces like the kitchen and the parlor so part of the home used by the family, but also for entertaining, um, like necessarily the separate parlor, are places of display. And they connect to this idea of respectability within the community. Respectability is a performance of sorts, a set of visible behaviors that display conformity to community expectations. That is to be thought of as respectable one needed to belong to a family deemed to be respectable by community standards, and also to keep performing those same behaviors to an audience of that community. The idea of respectability was part and parcel of this idea of the good home, a judgment dependent on the behavior of the family, uh, but predominantly on the abilities of the women of the household who had the responsibility of keeping both the physical space and the menfolk in order. And decor, the way in which the public spaces were designed to be experienced by others, is part of this informal rule set used to negotiate daily life and community status. Now, weaving was originally an eminently respectable behavior, a signifier of industry, of competence, and mastery of the domestic sphere. We also tend to think of it today as a sign of self-sufficiency, though in reality, home weaving required dependency on a large and equally industrious support system and infrastructure. Uh, you're either sending your wool out to the mill or you're going to need six spinners on spinning wheels to supply one full-time weaver. And weaving was a way for women, primarily women, to take care of their families. And especially in the later 19th century in Cape Breton, to earn wages. Weaving and displaying these coverlets and curtains was part of this performance of respectable skill and more importantly of connection to a specific kind of migrant respectability that materialized mythology and community history. 
the weavers are engaging in the transmission of cultural memory, one which gave status according to connection to the Scottish ancestry. The communal agreement about the importance of overshot became a part of the process of social identity, who a person is in relation to those around them. This dance of perceiving and being perceived in daily life creates the public image of a person, which can then be solidified by the material points of reference in their lives. We see this with places quite a bit. Um, Cape Bretoners are often defined by their connection to historical places and families. I'll give you the example of uh, Alan the Ridge MacDonald, whose family line was ever afterward known by that geography of their homestead, or the reverse example of Donald MacDonald, Dan the Dyer, for whom Glenn Dyer was named. And families' pasts are outlined in a way by the rising and falling diamonds and circles of the coverlets that their weavers created. This sense of place is a constant in the human experience. We attach meaning to places through use and familiarity and by proxy to objects that remind us of those places. So that t-shirt from the tourist trip to Paris, the snow globe, from mom's trip to Mexico. All of these things become that entire experience embodied in that one souvenir reminder. We view communities and our personal and group histories through our attachments to and our experiences with places. And that sense of belonging mediates everything about how we interact as social and geographical beings. We put meaning on geographical features and on landscapes and that storytelling in turn generates attachment in those who live there. This is called proximity seeking or an attempt to develop closeness with the desired place. And it's a mode of place attachment by proxy. And one that I suggest can be seen in the importance placed in many Cape Breton homes on these fabrics and specifically on the stories that come with them, their reputed connections to this transmission from the past. The spaces in Cape Breton where the Scottish settlers set up homesteads would have been familiar in some ways, even as things like the size of the forests and severity of the winter weather differed. Many of the families of the weavers came from locations in the Hebrides, the Isles of Lewis and North Uist in particular, and the geography of Cape Breton resonated with their experiences. The folklore of the old country the romantic ideal of the pastoral life took on new glamour the further removed it was from living memory, particularly when compared to mining and the industrial changes of the early 20th century. We have a longing for what was. Place attachment to new homelands for migrant communities works through the development of mnemonics for reference. Differences between a new town or landscape from the one left behind can be ameliorated through the development of material and visual and oral touchstones that generate insider knowledge and ideally connect to that which was left behind. I argue that markers like traditional handcrafts can serve similar functions to those of traditional music and dance in that recreation of and connection with the imagined homeland. Place attachment has become a newer lens for understanding how people relate to place, to communities, and to each other. Place attachment theorists Scannell and Gifford describe that narratives can be a symbolic mechanism of place attachment. Stories become about the emotional bonds we form to places in their role as proxies for communities. In other words, our understanding of self takes place in the stories of our origins. And that's doubly true in colonial spaces where the concept of place is itself shifting and regularly redefined. The narratives inherent in textile work, craft involving the human body as energy creator and often revolving around local materials and inspiration drawn from the environment can be used to understand how people create and maintain attachments and their own identities. Many of the drafts and coverlets collected from Cape Breton come with stories. This was a coverlet made by my grandmother from a draft taught to her by a neighbor that the neighbor's grandmother brought with her from the Isle of Lewis. And this binds the owner into a set time and space. 
and retelling these stories affirms the owner's connection to the community's collective history and their family's importance within that space. It's important to note the covers are not only local. They're a blend of local and imported materials, of traditional patterns and local variations. The warps are starched cotton imported from Guyana and the West Indies. We don't have any plants in Canada that will make a true blue dye, even blueberries make purple. The indigo is imported from England, as is the vermilion. And the wefts are homespun wool from imported black faced sheep brought with the colonists. Calling any of these simply Scottish or Gaelic would be reductionist, turning a complex series of connections across the Atlantic world into something easily digestible, linear, and inaccurate. So Overshot, despite all of these stories, turning it into an example of direct connection to Scottish heritage, becomes a part of an imagined identity, a connection to a place, a touchstone for this attachment to a place based on a fiction of unbroken transmission and unchanging tradition. Following Freed, we see that insecurity among recent immigrants would have created a need to make new and rapid place attachments in order to reinstate a sense of security. A material process of integration of older craft styles with new materials like local dye stuffs, Annie McLean's onion skins collection and so forth, acted as a method for reducing and expressing that separation anxiety. The stories act as a method um, attached to the old drafts and coverlets to reinforce old attachments to old places. When the drafts appear in Florence Mackley's collections with annotations with the stories about their origins on the Isle of Lewis or in the Highlands of being smuggled out and packed away, this is nostalgia in action, privileging an idealized Scottish identity. We can see this in other aspects of diaspora life, as historical identity is often exaggerated to provide a shared mythology as a focal point for community bonding. Now, this is something that is explicitly acknowledged in the mid 20th century when Mary Black arrives in Nova Scotia and she begins teaching her weaving classes. She incorporated history lessons into her weaving classes, starts to develop the mythology of the tartan as the Scottish textile. And she's drawing on advice of her occupational therapy mentor. And he wrote to her in 1933 about a project they were working on together saying, and I quote, be sure to incorporate a little history. Many patients are attracted to a craft if they know something of this and can feel they are reviving an ancient art. The student will probably have more respect for it also. This method of creating connection worked extremely well in the atmosphere of the time, a period where all things older and pre-industrialized are being idealized. Ian McKay called out this, and I quote, conscious elevation of pre-modern forms to symbolic primacy in modern industrialist society as part of his deconstruction of the, the concept of innocence. And he's calling out what he sees as a kind of fetishization of the less complicated past. But in this case, it serves a different, more positive purpose. It's about the urge, the, the drive for storytelling through textile, and that's ever present. When interest in tartan was at its peak in the mid 20th century, tartan weaving classes run at the Gallic College at St. Anne's in Cape Breton, filled up with people wanting to learn to weave their own family's tartans. This is less about learning history than it was about finding a way to stake a claim of saying, here I am, I belong to this concept and to both this and that place. An older and longer lasting tradition than Tartan in Cape Breton, the overshot coverlets given pride of display in the parlors and bedrooms of the island are a style far more deeply embedded in the Gaelic heritage of the region. And it's this feedback loop of connection, storytelling, attachment, use, retelling and reattachment that are part of the stories of place. Community and sharing reinforcing the attachments, which in turn drive that sense of belonging and of self. The folklore that's attached itself to the textiles of the Cape Breton Scots 
serves a valuable purpose. It binds the migrants to a concept of home, uh, comfort in the ideas of something unchanging to which one could, but wouldn't, someday return. The old life ways had proven unsustainable, both in the 19th century in Scotland and in the 20th century in Cape Breton as fishing turned to mining and the mines closed and communities looked elsewhere for meaning. Now, when we look at theories of identity making, one which jumps forward to me is a description by ethnologist John Gray of a process as one, quote, through which in creating places and forming attachments to them, people implicate an historicized image of themselves as people of that place, close quote. So when their identity could no longer be sustained by the older life ways, and as Dominica Lord Wood suggests, Scottish migrants to Cape Breton refocused on smaller, discrete pieces of those lives as touchstones, while other things around them modernized. Telling and retelling the stories of the origins of the weave elevates the concept of this woolen cotton blanket from something every day to a romantic conceit. Easing a transition into this new life by keeping signs and symbols that remind them of the old. Dissatisfaction with economic and agricultural opportunities in Cape Breton could be soothed by the respectable chore of manufacturing blankets and in such a way as to preserve the image of an anti-modern identity. The romances of Walter Scott may have elevated the mythos of the tartan in the Victorian mindset, but what caught the attention of Cape Breton weavers was the connection of overshot to their imagined history. An island past, still a vital part of their island present. Interviews about the old days in Cape Breton often include descriptions of things like milling frolics, the mills at Glendire, the sound of the looms hard at work. And we've seen a lot of research undertaken on the music and dance traditions of Cape Breton as playing a similar role, focusing attention on the supposedly traditional and folk nature of what is actually a thriving and modernizing genre. By attaching the concept of Scottish and traditional to movable goods and to visible tangible products of the resources of the new world, the sense of place attachment becomes itself movable this way to recreate the old and the new, and touchstone artifacts and crafts created an embodied physical link back to that idealized original space. These coverlets act as a touchstone, a physical materialization of collective identity that gets reinforced by retold stories of the Highland clearances, the Hector, and other founding narratives of the Scottish migration to Cape Breton. Diaspora communities tend to care much more about this sort of origin story than others, finding value in this idea of the unbroken chain to the past. David Snow calls this group identity seeking uh, a method of looking for a shared sense of we-ness, one structured around both real and imagined shared experiences. And these experiences could be real and memorable, or brought in from folklore and retold at firesides for generations until versions of the story are incorporated into a shared history. In this way, parts of that collective identity can be invented and yet still be a powerful and important part of that we-ness that shapes the group. So these overshot drafts don't need to have been from Lewis or Uist to serve the same memorial and cultural function as long as the stories stay attached, as long as the narratives stay with them rather than them being packed away into museum or into trunks in archives. The beliefs and memories inculcated into the designs, these are the patterns woven by our forebearers, turn them into indices of memory. Storehouses particularly for women's history and tradition. The stories bundled into drafts like Lady's Delight and Jessie Margaret's Draft prioritized women's travels and their relationships with their female relatives and their neighbors. The sense of pride that came along with being able to weave these complex pieces elevated a weaver's work from domestic necessity to a place of pride and a generator of respectability for the family unit. The histories that draw connections between today's overshot and that of 200 years ago may or may not be true, 
but the effects of those histories on the communities and on the weavers' self images are very real. So, to sum up, overshot coverlets are tied deeply to the history of settlement. The dramatic floating patterns are part of a tradition that definitely has its roots somewhere in European weaving, though the details have been obscured by time. More importantly, the concept of overshot as a Highlands and Islands skill is a factor in its cultural importance. As a subtextual measure of respectability, of pride in one's ancestry, and of community connection. The weaving pattern said to have been passed through the generations and displaying coverlets woven by one's ancestors was a way of declaring the strength of a family's lineage and a right to membership in the community. The coverlets and curtains themselves are focal points and materialization of that mythology. They are centers that encourage memory and storytelling. The decline of weaving in the early 20th century was partially reversed through rising interest in recapturing that partially invented past, as well as a sense of belonging and of family that had originally been beaten into the fabric after every pass of the shuttle. There we go. And that's me and there's my thank yous to folks who have helped dramatically with this research. Um, that's all I've got at the moment. I guess, I, do I mute myself now and let Sarah take the floor? Yeah, 